Carrie, welcome. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the birthday wish. I can't think of uh, a better way to spend my birthday than to be in this room with everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I know this time of year we think a lot about Martin Luther King, and one of my favorite quotes from him is, life's most persistent question is, what are we doing for others? And I know that uh, folks in this room are spending a lot of time asking that question, and so love to hear your answers today and learn and, and teach from each other. So um, I personally, just my, my story, I was a disconnected youth. Um, my parents, uh, in my early childhood, they were on welfare. My brother was born in a tent. I had a very disconnected childhood. I went to 17 public schools and homeschool, including inner city schools, as well as rural uh, schools, ultimately graduating down in the Ozarks where there's a big uh, drug crisis. Um, so I am so excited to talk about uh, a lot of these issues with the panel today. Um, and from that childhood, I, I was able to go on and uh, studied at Harvard, got my master's in public policy, uh, then worked for a think tank scholar. So I've, I've got that kind of combination of head and heart. And I think that that's what I'm hoping to get from our panelists today. And so with that, I'd like to invite our panelists to come up. Um, I will introduce them here uh, briefly as, as they're coming up, and then we will um, have each of them tell a little bit about what they're doing, what their work is, and then we'll have uh, a few questions amongst the panelists, uh, and then we'll do Q&A from the audience, as well as from online. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, don't be shy, throw your questions, and we will feed them over to our panelists. Do we have name tags, just so that audience can know? Great. Uh, am I sitting? Let's see, I don't know. I was not told. I guess. OK. <laughs> um, great. So I'm just going to go. Uh, as you can see in our panel, um, we've got uh, Kellen Butts, who is the Director of Charitable Operations at AT&T. Um, Cassius Johnson, Senior Director of Policy Engagement Affairs at Year Up. Uh, and then uh, Stephanie Nellens Page, who is Vice President of National Engagement at USA Funds. Uh, John Valverde, who is the CEO of Youth Build USA, if you want to wave. Uh, and then we've got Kimberly Pham, uh, who is an opportunity leader, and she'll tell us a little bit more what that means. Uh, but she had been a disconnected youth as well, um, and now uh, she has risen above that. And we, like I said, I, I want this conversation to be really a, a mix about what works uh, and uh, the theoretical and, and kind of combining that. Um, I, I just want to share a description of a photo maybe you've seen. Um, there's a picture of a crosswalk or a kind of a footpath, uh, and it has the footpath with the cement that's been you know, molded in with cement, and that's the path that people expect that people are going to take. That's the user design. And then the user experience is the footpath that's cut across the grass, and that's the path that people actually end up taking. So I think having a mix here of people who have used these programs or who have designed them and kind of a combination of the both, I think will be uh, insightful in terms of getting what actually works. Uh, so with that, I will uh, let each of the panelists go through and just give a few remarks about what you're doing in this area uh, to reconnect to disconnected youth. OK. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so at AT&T, we hire about 25,000 people uh, every year. And of those, about three-fourths have to have some form of technology in, uh, in what they do. So we really need to make sure that we have a talented, uh, diverse pipeline of people to fill those jobs every year. So what we're doing is uh, we're also committed to making sure that the, uh, we hit the 90% graduation rate by, the, uh, by 2020. So, but we know that high school graduation isn't enough, right? That's the, the starting point where we all, where kids need to, to jump off and, and get going. So we know that we've got to do, do things differently and think differently and act differently to make sure that we're re-engaging uh, the youth, the opportunity youth, to make sure that they're, they're ready to, uh, to start working day one. So what are we doing? Whole bunch of different things. First of all, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we try to make sure that, that opportunity youth uh, don't become opportunity youth. So one of the things that we do is uh, we spend a lot of time uh, mentoring with our with kids in our communities where we work. Uh, we are everywhere. We have 260,000 employees. So 
Since 2012, we've worked with, uh, with kids around the country uh, to provide like a million and a half hours of mentoring. So a million and a half hours of mentoring over that time for hundreds of thousands of kids to make sure that they're ready for, um, <coughs> for the workforce. Uh, we've also done things like work with, to develop what's called a nano degree with uh, Udacity. And what that is, it's a short-term certification that people can use uh, to get into the technology space. And then what we've done, haven't stopped there, what we've done is we, we've actually worked with some of our nonprofits to then uh, provide scholarships for opportunity youth to, uh, uh, to take those nano degrees so that they can then come to work at some place like AT&T. Uh, we've also worked with a lot of different uh, organizations that are focused on Opportunity Youth. So uh, to my left, your right, is, uh, is uh, Europe. So we've worked with, with organizations like Europe, uh, with General Assembly, uh, with a, a number of different uh, organizations like, uh, 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 who's that, uh, the other one that I'm thinking of is Perscolis, okay? That's another very important group that we've worked with. But we wanna make sure that, that, that the, the, the uh, young people in America are able uh, to then take advantage of, those, uh, of the educational system to get into the, to the workforce. So that's why we, we do that. And then lastly, uh, of the many, many things that we do, um, one thing that we've done is we, we actually have hired, uh, or one of our team members is responsible for working with all of the organizations that we work with uh, around the country to engage with those organizations like Europe and others uh, to make sure that, that we have opportunities for them to come into AT&T uh, to get back to those uh, 25,000 jobs that we, we need to fill every year. So in a nutshell, uh, that's what we're doing. Thank you, Callum. Hello. Hello. No instructions here. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Cassius Johnson. I'm Senior Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Year Up. And first, I want to describe Europe's mission, our model, and how we're uh, driving that mission, both in our direct service work and our desire to see systems change more broadly than the lives we're touching ourselves. So. Where our organization's mission is to close the opportunity divide for the five million or so young people who find themselves uh, exiting high school at, and without the skills they need to be successful in the labor market. They're out of school and they're out of work. And we do that through a basic of our model is this one year, as the name suggests. And the first part of that year, our young people are participating in what we call the learning and, develop, learning and development phase. And during that phase, they're learning uh, technical skills aligned with um, employer demand uh, and professional skills. And, um, and then the second part of the year, they're uh, engaged in an internship with some of the leading corporations in this country, American Express, State Street Bank, Salesforce, Google on the West Coast, and others. Um, young people, um, I've, right now I'm, I'm participating in one of those learning communities as a coach and getting to see the model very intimately from it's great to work for an organization that's doing direct service because you actually get to put a face to some of the policies that you're trying to advance. And they are come in with uh, some skills deficiencies and how to present themselves, how to communicate effectively in a business setting, how to work collaboratively in a team. Uh, and they, those you see immediately in a peer cohort environment, them blossoming being exposed to skills, and then in the second half of the year, having the opportunity to go practice. Uh, about 85% uh, of our young people end up um, with full-time employment, making it about $18 per hour. So our direct service model, we're doing that in 16 uh, cities and sites across the country. We're doing it by ourselves. We're doing it also in partnership with community colleges, um, and we're doing it in partnership with businesses themselves. And I think the unique thing to know about Year Up and what distinguishes us in some ways from others and uh, is that we are truly try to be a demand-driven employer, um, uh, dri demand-driven model in the sense that we are very intentional about establishing our value proposition to employers and that 
they have jobs, largely middle schools jobs that they're looking to fill. So we work to design a solution uh, uh, in the training that really meets with those entry level jobs. And we try to suggest to those employers that this is uh, talent that they need to be tapping into. And so that, that's a good uh, segue to the, the other component of how we're trying to advance that mission to close the opportunity divide. We're doing that through our systems change work. So Europe as an organization also invests in, invest in what are the other things that need to be happening beyond our direct service uh, model to actually change pr perception, practice, and policy across the country. And so we do the perception change. Uh, through a collaboration with uh, the Ad Council and an initiative called Grads of Life, which is an employer appointing um, a campaign that aims to change the perceptions of employers about opportunity youth, to disabuse them of the notion that these are disaffected youth, that these are keen economists, these young people who get it. They understand that they need to up their skills to get a foothold in the economy. But what they lack are access to opportunity or to quality programs that have the power to get them there. And so we, and on, on that end, we're looking at our model and trying to figure out what are ways that we may change practice of others in the field. Uh, and then thirdly, what policies need to be play, in place to kind of enable all that more broadly. So happy to dig deep into any of that, but that's our mission, our direct service work, and our systems change work. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Stephanie Nellens Page, and I am the uh, Vice President of National Engagement for USA Funds. Uh, USA Funds is a nonprofit organization, and our whole mission is completion with a purpose, which means we want students to pursue and successfully complete training and education that leads to a career and a fulfilling life. We do so by supporting a variety of philanthropic initiatives, such as our college value work and institutional innovation, but also by supporting several innovative, promising practices and organizations like Road Trip Nation and Education at Work. Uh, we're committed to seeing more students, whether you're graduating from high school or returning for many years away, pursuing the educational path that will lead them to success as they define it both professionally and personally. And we're determined to give the education consumer a voice in the national dialogue about post-secondary education through our partnership with Gallup and our upcoming Education Consumer Pulse. Uh, which is a daily survey of more than 350 education consumers across the U.S. To date, we uh, interviewed probably over 65,000 U.S. adults on their experiences, and we'll be reporting our results in upcoming uh, months. What are we doing around Opportunity Youth? Our work basically focuses on two major issues, helping students to understand the career and education opportunities they can pursue and connecting them with work experiences that build their skill set and advance them in careers. Investing in work-based learning programs for Opportunity Youth allows uh, them to find their purpose and identify a path toward a better life. Not everyone needs to follow the four-year degree path we know to be successful, and there are multiple ways of gaining skill sets and competencies at a lower cost with less time. And we hope to engage Opportunity Youth so that they can see the possibilities and paths open to them that work for them. A few of the programs that we fund are Genesis Works, where we're supporting their efforts to enhance post-secondary education, preparedness, access, and persistence for opportunity youth through training, internships, council, and alumni support. We also support Urban Alliance, and I think I saw the executive director and CEO, Ashana Smith, come in. And we're helping them to expand services that connect under-resourced and at-risk high school and college students to work opportunities in college through paid internships, formal training, and uh, mentorships. Also, um, Children, Youth, and Family Collaborative, we're supporting their programs to increase the number of foster youth and attending grad and graduating from college with work experience in their chosen fields. 
and of course we support um, Leaders Up, and you've heard about them, and we also support Year Up. Um, uh, through our support um, there, we're helping more low-income young adults go to poverty, to professional careers in, in, a, in a year. Um, so uh, with those various programs, we're hoping that we can collaborate here but even today and find more intersections um, that we can help to support this five million plus disconnected you. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, we're going to have to take a pause. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear from Kimberly. Uh, just uh, her personal story as an opportunity leader. Uh, let's, what, what's your firsthand experience about all that's been said here? We've heard some policy wonks, tax policy, blah, blah, blah. What's, what's it like from your personal experience? From my personal experience, I'm really impacted by a lot that was said. You know, I come from a low-income community um, where those tax credits do mean something to people like us who do try to work and try to get some money. And um, I mean, coming from the community I come from, it it's a small working class community. It's not a lot of people who work there. A lot of people are receiving assistance from the government. And where are you from? Um, I'm from Philadelphia. I apologize. I'm sure. from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm from a community, a section called Kensington, Allegheny. It's very high on crime and drugs. So opportunities are not visible in my community. You know, when I look out my door, like I tell people all the time, I see a strip bar. I see a lot of Corner stores, they're not really grocery stores because they don't really serve groceries to people, a lot of processed foods and things like that. Um, but, yeah, hearing a lot that was said and just hearing um, about we're not young leaders of the future. We are leaders today. We do the work right now as we speak. Um, just like hearing what Tim Scott said, you know, not just to lean in, but for people to lean on us, us young leaders, lean on me. I want you to know that I'm willing to work on the problems that I'm impacted by, as well as the um, problems that are impacting my peers and my family members, as well as you folks all in the room. You know, we all have a role to play, and some of us have different roles when it comes to it. Comes to it, and um, we're not always going to have the same standards, but I hope morally that we would all want the same things for one another. You know, you would want someone to be successful, you know, whatever that looks like on their pathway. You know, um, when I think when you first started the conversation off about the cement pa pathway, why is the path cemented? You know, we're constructing these paths. We can also repave the paths and they don't have to be cemented, you know, mm -hmm. um, with those different obstacles and challenges that we know we can definitely alleviate from the process for young people when it comes to programs and um, different policies that do impact, you know, communities and things like that. So a lot, there was a lot that was said that resonated for me, but, you know, those are some of the takeaways for me, you know, just being a young person that was involved in cross systems. You know, we have the education system, you know, which wasn't doing so well for me personally, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't really learning in my community, and I could identify that. Some young people can't. You know, um, for some young people, the, the quality of learning is low in certain communities. So you really don't know no better. You just think that's what you're supposed to know. And then, and then you go somewhere else, and then you realize, oh, I think I need to know a little bit more than what I do know. And how do I get that information? You know, we're not really being challenged on those type of skill sets. And um, things like that, but you know. Sure. Some of my no, issues. excellent. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Let's. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna have to set up a political action committee for Kimberly after this outside the door. <laughs> uh, let's hear uh, quickly from from John, and then I'll uh, have a couple questions, and then uh, we'll go to the the audience. Sure. Uh, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm six weeks into my new role as CEO at Youth Build USA. And uh, I know Youth Build's in the house here today as well. And uh, it just amazes me, six weeks in, how this crisis isn't being elevated to the level that's necessary for us to really motivate and initiate change in the world. Uh, having come from the criminal justice field where I worked for two decades, uh, it's amazing that in New York City, only in 2010, 
did I introduce young adult programs for court-involved uh, young people aged 16 to 24. It just amazes me that this crisis has existed since the 70s, named, and that we're still struggling with it in the way we are today. So I think it's very important that we educate more people about this, uh, that we it's not just in the opportunity uh, uh, youth space that this conversation is happening, but that it spreads beyond that. As many of you know, Youth Build is a comprehensive positive youth development program that offers opportunities in education, vocational services, opportunities for community service. It includes mentoring, that all elements that were mentioned here today, including counseling and healing. And it's so important to lift up that comprehensive programs are necessary for opportunity youth. We want to give four-week programs, eight-week programs. More time is absolutely necessary. And as a formerly incarcerated person myself who served 16 years in prison, I think back on my life, and there's no way that I would be where I am today were it not for the opportunities I had in education for the mentors I had in my life, as the senator mentioned as well, for all the pathways that have been created for me were created because someone believed in me before I believed in myself. And that opened the door for me to blossom in the ways many have said today. I am, from what I understand, the first CEO of a global nonprofit who is formerly incarcerated that is not the founder of the organization or that is not serving in the criminal justice space. As humbled as I am by that fact, the reality is if it doesn't signal that we can open doors and shatter ceilings and break barriers for people in the world to offer opportunities for people to live to their full potential, then it's meaningless. We have to build on the momentum we have. If I can be an example of what's possible, my hope is that the young people of Youth Build and all opportunity youth and all opportunity leaders in this country, in this world, can believe that they are not defined by their past, but by who they can be today and who they can be the rest of their lives. And we have to lift up that message and opportunities. We live in a country where one of our central values is opportunity, and another is second chances. And we have to believe in second chances, and we have to create the opportunities for our opportunity youth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, these are some amazing stories. I mean, between the senator and Kimberly and John, I mean, it's just, I feel like I'm on Oprah's couch right now. I'm just so moved. Um, but I want to bring you into the conversation, Callum, and ask you a quick question, because you work in corporate America, and a couple people have hinted at this, the, the problem of the disconnect between kind of the successful, wealthy people working in corporate America and then the people who need help and people who are not in that system. And I was really struck by what you said about at at and that you have 1.5 million hours of volunteer labor, people who don't need to be mentoring. doing this, or mentoring, Specifically sorry. Specifically mentoring. Mentoring, right. yeah. So how, how do you at at and motivate people to get outside of their bubble? Because that's another thing that we've heard throughout the day is, is these bubbles and people not talking to each other and people assuming the worst about each other. So how do you at at and motivate that, that level of millions of hours of mentoring? Uh, well, at at and we have 260,000 employees uh, and we have control over their paychecks. So that's a, Sticks and carrots. That, no. no, it's uh, really the, uh, the, the motivation comes from, um, from our employees. You know, be, as I said, we have 260,000 employees, right? We have a lot of people that have had a tremendous amount of, of different life experiences. You know, so we've had, you know, we've got the people that, that you know, that, that have been incredibly priv privileged and gone right through. But we probably have a lot more people that have had experiences where they have had to rely on uh, mentors or, or other people to help them get to, to the point of uh, where they are. Uh, you know, one example is uh, one of our, uh, our senior executives. Uh, she encouraged us, uh, she herself 
uh, grew up in rural Missouri. She worked while that's she my that's my territory. Right. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so she worked uh, worked while she was you know going to college. She started out as a, a call center rep, um, and then rose through the ranks. And now she runs uh, an entire organization where she's she's managing uh, those call centers as a senior executive. She encouraged us uh, in the in the foundation to say, hey, how can we find people like me? How can we find uh, people like like uh, like her? That we can, you know, work with them to bring them in into the company, uh, and we were actually able to to develop a uh, a, a program with uh, with Europe uh, that we've we've we're doing pilots in uh, we've we've started pilots in, in Miami and Atlanta to to make that happen. So it comes it comes from it comes very much from within our, our employees. We just we set up the opportunities for the the employees to take advantage of it, but you can't. Force them to do it. They've got it. They have to have that motivation, and they understand the the importance of, of working with uh, with uh, kids to, to to help them see the path forward. Excellent. And Stephanie, I want to ask you a question because you had mentioned about finding alternative pathways outside the traditional academic path. Uh, and I know that colleges is very important. Uh, there are a lot of things you can learn from college that can be applied. But I also want to ask you about the stigma of people who maybe don't go to college. Do you think that we have a stigma? And is there a way, do you think that we should try to, to break down that stigma? Yeah, I, I believe we do have um, a stigma for, because for so long, um, parents would and, you know, community leaders would always encourage, especially minority students, uh, to go to college. And, and so when you look at other alternatives and start to talk about technical schools like welding or um, auto mechanics and things of that <coughs> nature, then people go, well, no, they're offering our children something that they, something less. And when you look at a welder coming out of a technical school, you have this stigma that, okay, it's a technical school, and, but he's making $90,000 a year. And, you know, nobody is talking about that particular portion. So I think in communities, we have to get become more informed so that we can take that stigma away and not say that because you're, you're going, don't, you don't want to go to college, you'll do something less. I mean, I grew up in a family of 13, and I'm next to the baby, and probably half of us went to college, and the other half went to a technical school, but we were going to do something mm -hmm in my parents' house. <laughs> now, we were also, um, I will have to admit, we did tease those that um, went to a technical school, but once they graduated and they you know, were making more money. Then they're <laughs> laughing at you. <laughs> yeah, then that laughter just sort of stopped and the teasing sort of stopped. So I think it starts with us educating our communities that that's not a bad choice. Sure, thank you. Can I add oh, yeah, Kesha, sir. So I think that that, that idea of that college is not necessarily for all is an important mantra, uh, mantra for us to adopt. That that the, it as a theory of action and theory of change has advantaged the most privileged in our society. But as we move towards that, we also have to be intentional about making sure those technical programs and such are designed in a way that are aligned with labor market demand mm -hmm. and actually lead to jobs. I grew up in rural Alabama, where a lot of these programs were created and you saw streams of folks that looked like me going into uh, less than um, high wage tracks and that the civil rights issue around that is very real. So somehow we gotta walk that fine line and I think the line is best walked when we make sure those technical programs are designed in a way that talk about employability skills and the right set of technical skills that lead to a job. Sure. And Kasha, I want to follow on that because in your remarks, you'd mentioned uh, policy uh, as one of the, your key pillars that you're focused on at Europe. Uh, what policies could we do at an educational level? Because you're focused on the, that gap between maybe high school and college, but it seems to me, do you think in high school, maybe we should focus more on connecting what you learn in high school with the available actual employment and opportunities out there? So I'll just make it more a little bit more tangible than that. I'll just point to the Carl per Perkins Act, right? Uh, a formula grant that goes uh, federal to state to, to, to school districts and as such. An idea may be to make it more demand driven is really put some competition in that from state to local. And let's make it a competitive program that 
rewards those who really get the design right in lines of an employer and block man and get some outcomes, be outcomes focused and outcomes that look like labor market outcomes mm -hmm. instead of just formally grants and let folks just continue to perpetually run really poorly designed programs. So it's a design challenge. So we had to embrace that and policy has to enable it. And one way concretely was what maybe is make the state to local competitive. Sure. Competition. Always a good thing. All right, we actually got to leave it there. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I'm sure our panelists would be happy to answer any questions. So let's give a round here for our panel.